I am a master's student in the Future Sketches lab. Uh, and if you are new here, that is the lab that works at the intersection of technology, art, and design. Before I tell you about my time at the MIT Media Lab, I want to show you a manifesto I wrote in 2017. Here I was an undergrad, and I was at a crux in my life. I came into Carnegie Mellon with a painting portfolio, and I was attempting to pull a switcheroo on them and switch to computer science. And I wanted to read you the last point of this manifesto um, because it still is what guides my work today. I call to problematize technological determinism while empowering human agency. And I wrote this on the laptop that I spend all of my time on, named Charbot. And, <laughs> and um, this through, e even, even though I uh, went on to be a software engineer for, for five years working at various companies, this light is what guided me through those five years. And in those five years, I still engaged in my art practice, but it switched from painting to writing code. So as a practice, I will write code in front of an audience and have it be realized in real time. This brings the human back into the way that we consume code. I did this like on the weekends and like after hours, and I just brought it to a bunch of different places, places where code really shouldn't go, like festivals and clubs <laughs> and bathhouses, so all, all different places. Um, and after these five years, I thought I really wanted to finally immerse myself and create tools that allow for more creative coding. So one project that I uh, started working on at the Media Lab while I was here is implementing a novel rendering technique in a creative coding software. And it creates um, a 3D scan from a simple video of just orbiting a person twice. The algorithm will then extract the frames and the location of the camera point and we wrote a render in Open Frameworks, which my PI wrote. Um, he wrote Open Frameworks, and we ported this renderer to Open Frameworks so that we could create uh, visuals with this 3D scan, and we can explore the human body through computation. We can make the body kind of move like a mobile and really explore the medium, but first uh, center the human around it. Another project uh, is I called Olympic Form, where I made my computer watch the Olympics and I extracted the human body shape and compared that to every single uh, letter in the official Paris 2024 Olympic font. Uh, and then I made a font out of the Olympians. So here you can see a breaker, he makes the letter A. <laughs> and then I put it online so that anyone could type anything. And I found that um, <laughs> usually, uh, gymnasts and breakdancers worked really well with this. Oh, <laughs> it was my birthday last week, and I want to show the card that my cohort made me. It is so cute. It is inspired by Olympic form. <laughs> you can see Gory's commitment to being the best D I've ever seen. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just like, I just really wanted to show this because it just shows how supportive the Media Lab is for each other. Um, I've also been thinking about how to take interfaces and make them more playful. So something like the mouse, we use it every day. It is, I think, an extension of our digital body. And so here I ask the question of what if the uh, cursor was a drawing instrument? And I've made a bunch of these sketches. These are just like a small subsection of just you know, asking the question, this simple question of what, what could I work with? Uh, how, how can I make the um, interface more playful? I took this thought. Um, and applied it to my live coding practice. And so I started to make IDEs, what I call fantasy IDEs. Um, and an IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. It is what programmers spend all of their time in. It's basically the software that you use to write software. This is a software, <laughs> this is an IDE that I call the IDE that always compiles. And the idea is that um, if your code doesn't compile for more than a second, it'll send it to a large language model and have it compile it for you. So it kind of creates this collaborative and almost like adversarial relationship. And I took this to the stage and I started, I built a windowing system around this, uh, this fantasy IDE um, to then perform writing multiple shaders, which is the visual code that I write. And I also added a chatbot called Charbot, where you could ask it, whether it was introduced to the audience through a QR code, 
and they could ask the chatbot questions about the code. Because usually in my performances, people don't, they, they want to be able to engage with the, with the code more. And finally, uh, I wanted to tell you about one last conversation that I've had at the Media Lab that I think really sums up just like the magic. So I was sitting with members of my lab, and we were looking at the Charles. Rather, we were looking at the sky, and we were talking about how it was blue, really why it was blue. And we all concluded that we, we really can just have a hand wavy answer off the top of our heads, you know, like it's atmospheric scattering, you know, it's the particles in the sky. Oh yeah, that's why it's blue, yeah, yeah. But I really wanted to know why. And so, as a graphics programmer, I uh, looked up a graphics programming paper that um, really took, really translated the algorithm called Rayleigh scattering to, uh, to code, and I implemented it in uh, GLSL. And I, the input was white light from the sun. I coded this, and the output, uh, oh, well, well, the output was purple. <laughs> and one key component that I was missing, um, or actually that, that makes sense because um, the reason why the sky is blue, what Rayleigh scattering says, is that the shorter wavelengths get caught in the particles in the sky. And what comes through is the rest of the wavelengths. So it makes sense that it would be purple. And this kind of like, uh, I was asking like, thinking about like why, why isn't it purple? <laughs> And my cohort member, Jessica, told me that it's because the sun is made out of part, mostly blue light. There's less purple light. So okay, fine, I implemented my code, I changed it, I added, I added more blue light, that's okay. Ah, we have our blue sky. Then I wanted to see what the sunset looks like. Basically, the reason why the sunset is red is because when you look at the sun at an angle, there is more atmosphere for the light to go to, so the longer wavelengths also get caught in the sky, right? So the shorter wavelengths get caught, and then as the atmosphere expands, more and more light waves get caught. Amazing, so I implemented that. The sunset was green. Listen, I didn't skip this day in kindergarten. I know <laughs> that that makes sense. Between blue and red is indeed green. Uh, so, you know, we, we asked ChatGPT and, you know, the, we Googled it. Google actually gave incorrect answers. <laughs> the actual answer is a lot more complicated than I can just express in 10 minutes. But basically, there's a lot of different reasons. I just went with green scatters more. So I implemented that in my code, that green scatters more. And there we go. We have our red sunset. And so through creative code, I learned to not ask the question of why the sky is blue, but why isn't it purple? And why aren't sunsets green? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.